We're going to have to hire you as our and this afternoon. Um, first, let me welcome you and thank you for being a part of the uh, Grassroots Advocacy Training uh, 2018. I'm Max Burns. I have the privilege of uh, being a part of the Board of Directors for the Fulbright Association. I have had the privilege of uh, spending 30 plus years in higher education. I was a faculty member, a department head, a dean, a college president, but uh, I did a Fulbright in Sweden in, uh, 2000, in 1993. It's been a long time since I was there. I was a senior scholar there, did some research and teaching and writing and things like that. But uh, I also had the privilege of serving in the U.S. Congress about a decade and a half ago. It's been a while now. Many of, the, many of my colleagues are either gone or gratefully in senior leadership positions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, my background is uh, chairing the advocacy efforts for the Fulbright Association. It's been a very active and um, a positive experience for me, and I hope for those of you who are a part of this as well. We've got a lot of work to do this afternoon. We're going to be very, very uh, uh, quick with some slides. Again, uh, I want you to uh, hang with me, and we'll go through this thing pretty, pretty quickly. Chaz, I need control. Let me see if I can get my. There we are. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're working through the, the first slides. These are all going to be available for you. But basically, uh, we have to renew our Stand for Fulbright campaign. Many of you were part of our efforts last year. Thank you very much. But uh, today we have a new challenge and, uh, and a new day, and, a, and a, uh, it seems to be a little bigger challenge than we faced in the past. But we have to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of our grassroots advocacy. And that's really what this training is all about. It's about grassroots advocacy. We want to train our individuals and our chapters to uh, complement our Hill advocacy efforts with local advocacy with the support and the cooperation of the Fulbright Association. So we're going to brief you on our ask, the, the messaging that's a part of, uh, of our, our visits to D.C. and will be a part of our visits to those state and uh, district representatives, senators and representatives who you might meet with. Uh, we we want to work through some training. Uh, many of you, this is a reminder, so this is not something that you haven't seen before. It's probably something that you are comfortable with. Some of you may have seen it for the first time. You may not have had a chance to, to be a part of our Washington advocacy efforts. If you haven't, I hope you can join us on the 21st. If you can't, uh, I'll be candid and tell you that you can do more good in your district and in your state than you can in Washington in many cases. So we want you to do that. Uh, we're gonna do the training. It's gonna take about 35, 40 minutes. Uh, we wanna ask you to use the chat feature to submit written questions and just go to the chat and use the chat function. You can direct it to the to the group, but the good news is that we have other experts on the line, including John Bader, Manfred Phillips, uh, Shaz Akram, and um, Bruce Fowler. And when we get to responding to your questions, uh, you know, I'm gonna ask them to chime in and, and, uh, and respond as appropriate. If you're seeing the webinar as a recording, we're gonna be recording it, and you have questions during that during that viewing, if you would just uh, email uh, our association, advocacy at fullbright.org with your questions and we'll respond to those. So um, let's begin quickly um, and work through our, our seminar and you post your questions as they may arise. Uh, you know, we're all Fulbright alums. We've all had a Fulbright experience. We've all had the opportunity to have our lives and our careers changed by that Fulbright program. Uh, your life changed, my life changed. Uh, 380,000 alumni worldwide. We have the largest alumni network anywhere in international education. It is the anchor of our international diplomacy and has been for over 70 years when it was created by Senator uh, J. William Fulbright. We are now in 165 countries and it's an amazingly powerful force, peace and understanding. And I, I know you believe that. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be on this call. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be involved. 
So the good news is you are the experts and you can tell a story with uh, with absolute confidence. Um, it's uh, vulnerable. The Fulbright pro program is vulnerable. One thing that you need to understand that I need to understand is the program is appropriated by Congress each year. So it's one year funding and there's no guarantees. No guarantee will continue. It's referred to as discretionary funding, discretionary spending. There is no endowment. There is no foundation. There's no independent source of funds. It must come from an appropriation through Congress. And you need to understand that uh, congressional appropriations, is, it's a, there's a two-step two process. There's an authorization phase and an appropriation phase. This is appropriated through the Department of State. It is a Department of State program in the, in the Department of Education and Cultural Affairs, ECA. And we have to educate Congress about this program. Members of Congress and their staffs turn over very quickly. Uh, of the 435 members of Congress that were there when I was a part of that body, I would say a lot less than half are there today. Probably less than 200, less than 150. Senator Fulbright, regrettably, his efforts to champion the program for the last 70 years after he passed away and the Fulbright Association uh, was created. The bottom line is many members of Congress don't know about the Fulbright program. They don't recognize its impact or its history. And that's what our job is. Our job is to tell the story of the Fulbright program. Um, the administration has proposed a cut to Fulbright and they proposed a cut last year and now they're proposing an even larger cut this year. Now, before we all get excited and, and you know, say that the sky is falling, the 47% cut that was proposed in 17, by the way, the, the president can propose, propose anything he chooses to. He does not have the power to appropriate. He has the power to propose and Congress appropriates. So uh, proposed 47% cut in 2017, that was for the FY18 budget that we're in currently. Our advocacy efforts had a tremendous impact. Last year, 91% of members of Congress were contacted, 12,000 alumni and friends signed the petition. We had two advocacy days with over 200 meetings on the Hill. And basically we stood up or Fulbright and defeated the president's administration proposal. Again, the administration's proposal is one of being ill-informed or poorly informed. But we in bipartisan support in Congress. Please remember this. We're not Republicans and we're not Democrats. We're Americans and we're Fulbrighters. And we don't, we're not concerned about which party you're affiliated with. We're concerned about your support or the Fulbright program and the good it does across the globe. This year's cuts are even more onerous. Right now, White House is suggesting 71% cut. That's a huge cut to the Department of State and a huge cut to Fulbright. And we cannot sit by and allow that to occur. So through our nationwide advocacy efforts, we need you to stand up for Fulbright in 2018 as we prepare for the 2019 physical year budget, FY19. So, let's see if we can move forward. As I'm having trouble. All right, advocacy. Again, most of you know this. We'll quickly review it. You know, it's really a, an education process. We, our, our goal is to educate Congress on the issues and on the Fulbright program. Uh, it's a key responsibility of the Fulbright Association. It's, it's really what we exist to do is to preserve the Fulbright program. We want Congress to make informed decisions. We don't want them to go on hearsay or ignorance. You are the best person equipped to tell the Fulbright story. You know why it's a smart investment. You know what impact it made on you, 
in your organization, your community, state, nation, you, you, you know, and you can share that. The Fulbright community, both the past and the future, need you to tell the story in order to inform Congress to save the program. I'm at, at it again. There we go. Whoops. Not good. All right. What we're working on today is a very comprehensive campaign, a very comprehensive integrated campaign that'll include petitions and write ins and call ins between March the 5th, that's Monday, and March the 20th, which is the Tuesday before we go to the Hill. We need thousands literally thousands of people of friends of our international education and alumni and supporters to stand up for fulbright and we have two requests and we'll go through the ask in more detail in a few minutes but the first ask is do not support the administration's proposed cuts they just that doesn't make any sense so the first thing you say is we don't criticize anybody we're just saying don't support the administration's proposed cut to the Fulbright program. And second, help to restore funding. And again, we're going to make a request at $252 million. That's a nominal increase over prior years, but not much. We'll talk about that. But the bottom line is, March the 5th through the 20th, we need a lot of people involved in advocacy. And then on the 21st, will be our uh, advocacy day at Capitol Hill. We're going to uh, schedule visits with dozens and dozens and dozens of members of Congress to advocate for Fulbright. We'll take teams of volunteers there. Um, those of you who can join us, we welcome you. We want you to be a part of that process. Uh, if you can't be in Washington, we understand. But that doesn't mean you can't be involved in advocacy. And that's where we are today. So. Let's look at that third major point, grassroots advocacy efforts, which is really what we're at today. We want to visit district and state offices of members of Congress. So you want to visit the district office of your congressional representative. You want to visit the state office of your senators, your United States senators. So after the after we do the call in, write in, petition between the 5th and the 20th. Then we'll do advocacy day on the 21st. Then we'll do grassroots efforts between March the 23rd and April the 6th. This is the spring congressional recess. We want to build on the momentum of the first two components of the campaign. And we want to contact every member of Congress, both House of Representatives and U.S. Senators, extremely powerful. And we have the ability to do that because we have thousands of Fulbrighters, tens of thousands of Fulbrighters in the United States and our friends. So local offices, local congressional offices, local state offices, sometimes we don't, we don't think about them when we think about policy. They're overlooked. Uh, there's a greater chance for you to meet with a member or a senator directly if you do it in your home state or at, in your home district. And we're going to talk to you about how to do that. Um, I always, when I was a member of Congress, I was always in the district during recesses and I was always available for meetings. So here's what you do. You have to know who your representative is, your house member. If you happen to be in Los Angeles County, California, there are last count, I'm, I'm probably uh, inaccurate now, but at one time there were 27 members of the United States House of Representatives in some portion of LA County. If you're in LA, if you're in San Francisco, if you're in Chicago or New York or any of our major metropolitan areas, in Atlanta, Georgia alone, there are about five U.S. congressmen that touch the metro Atlanta area. Now, there are only 14 congressional members in, from the state of Georgia, and there are 27 in California. So, first of all, know who your representative and your senators are. I hope you already do. 
I hope you know what their district or their state office is. I hope you know the names of their scheduler, their, their district scheduler, their state scheduler. Uh, but if you go to house.gov or senate.gov, you can find that out. You can find out what their names are, where their district or state offices are, the phone numbers. They, I'll tell you right now, they're going to want you to, to contact them. You can call them if you like, and I want you to do that. But if you want an appointment, you're going to have to send an email, and you're going to have to get out in front. And if you're going to meet with them between the 25th of uh, – 20, I guess 22nd of March, 25th of March, and, and uh, 6th of April, you're going to have to move quickly. But – once you know that, we need for you by March the 5th, those of you who are on this call, to let us know, let the Fulbright Association know that you are willing to visit a member's office in your area. So, send us an email, advocacy at fulbright.org. Tell us what office or offices you can visit. You don't have to limit yourself to one. If you can visit two or more, that's great. We just need the story told. But tell us which offices and which members you would like to, to visit, and we'll contact you or connect you with the chapters in your area who will work to schedule the visits between the 30, 23rd and the 6th, and then they'll contact you with the details on the visit. Certainly, flexibility is the key. You can't pick the day or the time. You're going to have to work on the member schedule and accept the time availability that they may have. So we're moving quickly through this. I hope you I hope we're uh, uh, not overwhelming you too quickly, but uh, you hit your uh, hit your question buttons and let us know what you would like to uh, uh, to have your questions answered. But we're going to ask the chapters to really step up. Our, our, we have 50 or more active chapters across the nation. And each chapter president or advocacy director are going to receive the volunteers, the list of regional volunteers from the Fulbright Association on or about the 5th of March. You tell us that you're willing to go. We're going to, we're going to share that information with the, the chapter presidents or advocacy directors. Then they're going to contact you and the members of Congress and begin to put that match together. Uh, once you know the team of volunteers that will be visiting a member or a senator, I, I recommend that you go with at least one other person, I think a minimum of two, and probably not more than four or five. Sometimes you can have too many, but uh, two, three, four is fine, five is okay. But you, you've got to make sure that you're coordinating with two or more individuals. Uh, the contacting the, the, the congressional offices and asking for an appointment um, to discuss the Fulbright program, uh, uh, program is going to be the responsibility of the chapters, and then you need to be flexible with that. They will tell, the, tell you, really, the volunteers, the date and the time, the location, the meeting, and then they're going to let us know in Washington, those of uh, the staff know in Washington, so that we can support you and send you the materials for the meeting so that you'll have uh, all the information you need to be prepared to talk to the member. All right, as we go through the meeting, sorry, if you have, a, if you have an appointment with a, a member, even in, the, even in the congressional district or state office of a, of a U.S. Senator, remember time is limited. You, you, you have to plan for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. You can't get it done in 10 minutes. You may not get more than that. You may get 15. You may get 20. I, I mean, I've, I've had wonderful experiences where members are very gracious with their time, and they're not in a hurry to leave. So for you to leave, or they don't have somewhere they have to be, I always like to schedule meetings when they don't have any pressing appointments behind it. You may not have that flexibility. But remember that time is limited. You have to go through your points quickly. Introduce yourself. They need to know you are a constituent. They need to know you are a voter. They need to know that they represent you. Where you live. Tell them that you're a Fulbright alumni. Where did you do your Fulbright? If you're a Fulbright, fine. If you're a friend of Fulbright, tell why you're a friend of, of, of Fulbright. And let them know what you do now. How has that impacted your 
current position. Remind them that you are there for only one reason. You only have one reason to be there. You're there to support and ask for their support of the Fulbright program. And you're there to help them better understand its importance and its impact. One of the best ways you can do that is tell your story. It, it really illustrates the uh, importance of this program. Hey, Max. It's the primary value that you bring to the meeting. Max, is so, John. Yeah, hey, John. Could you back up one slide? You skipped over one slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't realize that. I, I, my, my controls aren't working right. All right, hold on. Let's see if I can do that. There's a time delay, so not, not uh, there you go. And then skip over the next. Uh, thank you. I see that there's a time delay. I'm sorry. All right, we'll go through this and then we'll we'll wrap that, that next slide up. My apologies, John. Thank you for letting me know that. All right. Um, as, you, as you are preparing to go to the meeting, the state chapter or your local chapter will um, coordinate the meeting and let the volunteers know and then inform the DC office. As you get ready to go into the meeting, you have to make sure you know what you're asking for. We have an ask, we have a messaging. All resources are available at fulbright.org slash advocacy. And you're going to get a leave behind folder. You're going to get a, a, a set of leave behind notes. So make sure that you have those and your team has those before you go to the meeting. Also know as much as you can about the representative or the senator. You know, what committees are they on? Very important. Every member, some members are more important than others. So if they're on foreign policy, if they're on appropriations, education if, if they're a chairman or a subcommittee chairman you need to know that uh, you need to know where they went to school if they went to school at the university of nebraska you need to make sure they they know that there are fulbrighters at the university of nebraska and you also need to know fulbrighters who have been at the university and are now uh, have been overseas and had the experience. You're going to need to coordinate that with your other advocates and your other team. Make sure you know when and where you're going to meet. Be at least 15 minutes early. Kind of be, don't, don't go into the office more than about 10 or 15 minutes early, but be there 10 or 15 minutes early. Make sure you know who leads the discussion, who's going to be Possible for telling the Fulbright story or stories. Again, you want to tell a story, but you, it's not you, through the ask. So be aware of your time. You've got about three minutes or so to tell the story, maybe four, three to four minutes. How did it impact you? And then who on the team is going to make the ask? Again, two things do not support the proposed administration cuts and support funding increases to restore the really 2010 level and then finally who closes the meeting so as you prepare for the meeting make sure you do those things in order to to have an effective meeting and, and now i'm going to try to see if there's a delay okay don't want to skip a slide again there it is so we went through this. Uh, I'm going to just reiterate the fact that tell them who you are, tell them where you live, tell them where you did your full right. Make sure they know you're a, you're a voter. They represent you. Remind them that you're there for only one reason. That's to support the Fulbright program, to ask them to support the Fulbright program. Tell your story, but don't be... Uh, too elaborate. Don't take a, don't take too much time. Make sure it's it's succinct. All right. Whoever is responsible for the ask, whichever member is responsible for the ask, you have a there is a, a stand for Fulbright uh, summary that's out on our web. You you but you look them in the eye and you ask them. Just don't you know? Just say 
We request that you not support the proposed administration cuts to the Fulbright program. Just tell them it doesn't make any sense. It's the most respected and effective program uh, for citizen diplomacy in the history of our nation. And then secondly, urge them to restore funding, help begin the process of restoring Fulbright funding uh, at 252 million. If they want more information, candidly, that's a 5% increase over FY18. FY18 was at 200 million. But it'll take four years of those, that modest in, increase in funding to restore Fulbright to 2010 levels. So whoever has that ask, again, look them in the eye and say, I need your help. Senator, can I count on your support to ensure the Fulbright program is not cut by the administration. Explain to that member that Fulbright is a smart investment. It's a smart investment. It's not an expense, it's an investment. Every four-star general in the military will tell you that the last thing you wanna use is force. You wanna use diplomacy and you wanna use relationships Relationships and partnerships. It is a major investment to our national security because we have friends and alliances across the globe. It really supports local economies so that visiting Fulbrighters and local alumni can to the local economy of the member. And then finally, it certainly supports international education, research, teaching, and exchanges, and certainly language and cultural education are a major part of that. Here we go. I'm trying to make sure I don't skip a slide. Hopefully they will know, but don't count on a member or a staffer. You may be meeting with staff, that's okay. If you'd like to meet with members, but if you meet with a member, the staffer is going to be in the room. Uh, you'll never meet, I shouldn't say never, rarely will you meet with a, a, a member who is not accompanied by a legislative assistant or a legislative director or a chief of staff or one of his assistants. So you may have to explain the program is a global program in 155 countries that two of every three grantees are really, are really people who come into the United States for educational purposes. They spend money locally. They're on restricted visas that require them to return home. Make sure that the member understands that. This is not an immigration program. This is an educational exchange program. And that we have foreign governments who contribute $103 million to the program. And, and that's a roughly, almost half of what the U.S. put. And in some countries, they actually contribute more to the Fulbright program than the United States does. And an example is in Germany. We have 1,300 universities and colleges who have grant recipients. And the Fulbright name is the most respected and admired internationally changed program in the world. So you may need to give them that fundamental background. We, you're going to have a leave behind that'll, that'll provide a lot more information on the Fulbright program, but this is just a quick summary. Um, as we move along, um, we want to talk about how to be successful. And the first thing you want to do is to be positive. Stay positive. Don't go in there with woe is me, the administration's kind to destroy the Fulbright program. You know, do not criticize anyone. Do not criticize the administration. Do not criticize the member. Do not criticize the party of the member. Do not make disparaging remarks about the opposition party of the member, okay? So the yeah, good news is just stay positive. Do not mention the president. Don't even, do not mention his name. Do not refer to him as the president. Don't, do not say the president's proposed cuts. Say the administration's proposed cuts. 
We want to avoid the confrontation, if at all possible. We're, gonna, we're not confrontational. It is by, we have friends on both sides of the aisle. If we didn't have friends on both sides of the aisle, we could not be successful. And you're talking about Fulbright, and candidly, they like talking about things that are not controversial. There's no conflict, and what you want to do is keep it that way. Uh, I know that many of you have other issues. Boy, there are tons of them out there. And, um, you know, just look. But, but the point is, you are not there to advocate for anything other than Fulbright. You go into that meeting with mixed messages. So don't bring up other issues. As much as you may want to talk about, name that issue, you can't do that at this meeting. You have to keep on message. You've got to focus on Fulbright and the support for the Fulbright program. Make sure that um, somewhere along the line, there's a personal connection. Um, your personal story or what you have done since your Fulbright and the impact it's made on the member's district or the member's state. Make sure that they remember something, some feature that, 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 you know, in six months they'll remember and say, oh yeah, you came to me and you told me about, and they can re relay that, that back to you. So try to find something among the group and um, that can stick with the member. Um, I recall a meeting with a United States Senator one time before I was in, in the United States House, and it was so important that we do something that he could remember us by, and it was a different era, a different function, but the key is you want to make it personal. You want to you enjoy it. You want to be positive. You want to you want to have a lot of fun with it. It is a lot of fun. This is a this is something you will enjoy, and that your team will enjoy. And the members are going to be very gracious. They may not commit. They commit. They may not commit, but they're going to be very gracious because you're their constituent. You know, you, you vote for them, and they fundamentally work for you uh, collectively, not individually, but collectively. Oh. Hopefully you'll be successful as you work through this. I'm trying to advance the slide one at a time. There we go. Okay. We're uh, we're wrapping up. Max, you skipped one. Uh, I did. I fixed to say, Kelsey, you're in control. Yes. I, think that, I can't quite keep that thing from. Okay, we'll go to we'll go to slide sixteen for you. Uh, yeah, I think say I don't have the slide number, so I can't tell. Ah, there we go. There we go. That's the one that went fastest. You, uh, when you finish when you've ended the meeting and you feel it's time to to wrap up, uh, let the member give you the signal. Okay, they'll they'll let you know. But thank them for their time. Thank them for their time. Um, you will never, you will never thank them enough. So thank them for the time, their attention, their service to the nation. I want you to know people think that this is some glorified position, but you know, they're working pretty much 24-7. And uh, it's a tough public service job. So thank them for that. Ask them if they need additional information. If they need information, let us know request to the advocacy at fullbright.org tell them that you appreciate their support thank them for what they supported in the past ask them for their support in the future make sure they have the lead behinds um, get the business cards of both the member and every staff member who is present please get the cards the business cards of the staffers turn over more rapidly than members and sometimes it's very hard for us to keep up with who is responsible in a minute for, for this issue. So make sure you get business cards. Hopefully you'll get a chance to take a photo, get a group photo. That's especially true if you met with the member, either the House member or the U.S. Senator. Uh, post it, post that on your 
uh, web accounts or social media, as well as send it, send a copy of that to the national office see uh, dot, dot, uh, fulbright.org. Um, Kelsey, can you advance? Uh, it says I have controls. I think it's the delay. Okay, okay. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, once you finish the meeting, let us know about it. Send us an email. Who'd you meet with? What was their contact information? Scan those business cards and send us the scanned images of those business cards, or just take a picture with your phone and send us the phone. But tell us who you met with, when you met with them, and you know, a sentence or two about about what you, how you felt the. the uh, post your pictures on social media. You know, um, they love good news. They love positive news. Make sure you hashtag. Uh, stand for Fulbright. Make sure you include the members or senators hashtag and share that with the FA office. When you get back to your office, your home, your place of business, whatever you do, write them a note, send them an email, both to the member and the staff, thanking them for their time, thanking them for their support. By the way, you thank support whether or not you got a commitment or not, because you expect them to support your position. That's their job. <clears throat> Make sure that you become active in your local chapter. You know, you might want to uh, consider being the advocacy chair. Appreciate you doing that, advocacy coordinator, and get others involved. Um, and develop an advocacy plan for your chapter. Um, Make sure we're, they're, they're going to, in the, in the Easter recess here in a few weeks, uh, after around the 25th of March, they'll be on Easter recess another major time for you to meet with members in your state or in your district at their homes, their home districts is during the August recess. Whenever members are, um, are in the district, they will have a scheduled any number of town halls or listening sessions. These are open um, listening sessions. There's not a, anyone can come Anyone can ask questions. Usually, they're in a in a in a, a non-confrontational uh, environment. You know, sometimes they become confrontational if there's a if the member has a, a political opposition and the political opposition chooses to to use that forum. But oftentimes, they're really good opportunities for you to get close to the member and talk to them directly. And again, anticipate that. The, the, the members will be speaking at Rotary civic organizations. They're going to be going to functions that you can be a part of. Um, so make sure that you take advantage of that. And then finally, make sure that you invite the congressional offices to your events. Make sure that they know what you're doing and invite them. We'll talk about more later on. How do you get a member to an event? And, and what do you do when you get them there? And um, but get, get the staffers there. Sometimes bring the staffer over and ask them to participate in one of your local chapter events. You'll be in a much better position to to ask them for their support in the future. So um, I I think we're pretty close to the end of the slides. Is that right, John? Kelsey, Great. questions. Yeah. Yeah, we are just the last slide is uh, is questions. Yeah. Questions, right? So we're we're glad that you were a part of this. Uh, I, I is, let me let me uh, go around the horn just for a second. Uh, uh, I'll start with John uh, Bader. John's our executive director of the Fulbright Association. John, any any words of uh, encouragement or insights? Of course. Uh, I'm first of all, thank you, Max, for the time and expertise, and uh, and doing a great job on this uh, on this presentation. Uh, all of you on this call, we're so grateful to you for the time you're spending this afternoon with us. Uh, and we hope uh, you found this useful and inspirational to go out and get into those uh, local district and state offices. Uh, it will be incredibly powerful because most of those folks at the local level, as, as Max has pointed out, they're dealing with constituent services, you know, if you didn't get your veterans benefits or your social security check, or you just have a problem with a local pothole, 
Um, a lot of these uh, folks do not always have the chance to talk serious policy, and you will be a welcome visitor to them, and it will be a really exciting part of, the, frankly, of their day, a memorable one and a powerful one. This chapter level, at the local level, across the country, this is a value added that the association can give to the Fulbright community that no other organization can do. We're, you know, we have other partners in this. We have the Alliance, we have IIE, we have other friends, but none of them have the resources that are represented by those of you on this call, meaning folks across this country who are committed to Fulbright and can take the message at a local level. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful to you. Um, Max, I've got two questions that uh, that have been posted, and I want to invite other folks to go ahead and and post others uh, right now as we're we're doing this. But the first one, uh, Max, is uh, can we can we invite visiting Fulbrighters, uh, meaning foreign internationals, uh, to advocacy visits? Um, I'll answer that question myself, and the answer is yes, of course. Um, Having somebody who is experiencing the grant right now is a terrific idea. Um, obviously, they're not constituents, but they can speak to the power of the experience, and they can illustrate how uh, the grant is uh, benefits local economies, uh, spending the grant right in that neighborhood. So that's a good question. The second question, Max, you can answer. How do we encourage chapter members to participate in local advocacy efforts. In other words, how do we as chapter leaders encourage other folks to do as we're talking about today? I think the best way to get local chapter members involved is to make sure they understand the importance of it um, and why it's worth their time, why it's worth their investment. Uh, you know, we, we can't afford a 46% cut. We can't afford a 71% cut. We can't afford that type of a Fulbright reduction in support. It'll just devastate the program. You know that, and I know that. And, uh, you know, I don't want us to be negative. I, I want us to be positive. But the only way we are going to be successful is by advocating with members of Congress. Because the, the, the administration is not listening. And they have a separate agenda, and we need to be on a, on a team that can um, preserve and protect and enhance the Fulbright program. So I think you're going to get your, your chapter members involved by making sure they understand how significant the challenge is and why it's important for them to be a part of it. Um, it, it is a positive experience. I've never had a negative experience uh, during my uh, efforts to advocate for Fulbright, and I don't anticipate you will either. Now, I will tell you, there are some ill-informed individuals out there who don't understand the value of the program, and they, for whatever reason, don't see the investment as a positive one. And your job is to help them understand that there's a positive investment. So. Uh, Recruit two or three worthy associates. If you're in a chapter and there is not as strong an advocacy group as you'd like, uh, you identify two or three worthy associates and you build your team. You know, it really only takes three or four people. And once you get three or four, you can you can you can interact with one or more members of Congress. And once you've been successful a time or two, and what you do is get those members to recruit two or three others and you build three or four teams. So I would say it's grassroots. We know that. Uh, are we going to be uh, as successful as we'd like? I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. But it really depends on you. Um, I do think that uh, I pointed out it's always helpful to have an active Fulbrighter as a part of the discussion because it puts a face to what the program does. I would suggest that you you not take a whole no, a large number of these. Don't 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 go out to your local university and take thirty or forty Fulbrighters from the University of name that place in to see representative whomever. Um, you know, pick a articulate representative 
that would be non-confrontational. I, I would be very cautious about uh, dealing with issues of uh, international um, hot spots. I don't know how to be cautious about saying this, but um, certain areas of the world generate larger numbers of angst and what you want is a positive reinforcement. So I'd pick one very, very strong um, representative to attend with me. And again, that, that would be the fourth member of a group um, and, uh, and not let it get more than four or five. Okay. Uh, Max, we have uh, another good question from Ted. He asks, can we invite Fulbrighters who are not members of the association? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're most welcome to do that. Of course, then you put the screws on them and get them to join the association. <laughs> then you say, well, you should be a part of the Fulbright Association. But no, we want every Fulbright alumni involved in this and every Fulbright uh, and every friend of the Fulbright program involved in this, whether you're a member of the association or not. We're just facilitating the efforts of, uh, of advocacy. That's what our job is to facilitate. And so just to underscore this for the, for the segment of the campaign we're calling All In. It was on yes. the earlier slide where people can call in and write in and especially sign a petition. We're very keen on circulating that to everybody we can, um, meaning uh, anybody who is concerned about international education and exchange should be uh, signing in and letting their members of Congress know how important that is. Yeah, Kelsey, go to that slide, the all-in slide. There you go. So now that we've kind of gone through the presentation, I hope those of you who are on the call today, let me again agree with John and thank you for being here. We're trying to create a very integrated campaign. And the petition in call in that first, first uh, position on that slide, all-in petition, that's where we want everybody involved. We need really, literally, tens of thousands of people on this one. We had 12,000 last time. We need 25,000 this time. And uh, so we, need, uh, we need a petition, a write-in, a call-in. I mean, just we'll, we'll help you with that, but we've got to get thousands of people to do that. And you, that's not what we're asking you to do. We want you to be a part of that, but really, we're, we're getting – through that process, then the National Advocacy Day, and then the grassroots, which is what we've been talking about for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Max, we have another question that's germane to this from Darlene. She asks, should we have our members write letters to them even if they can't go with us? We could Absolutely. leave letters with the people we visit. Go ahead and answer that question. Absolutely. The more you contact that member, the better. Letters emails, phone calls, you can get a text message to them, do it. But, you know, if you do that, if you can't attend a member's visit, send an email and say, I support Fulbright and I've got colleagues who will be visiting you on whatever date. I want you to be receptive to what they're going to ask you to do. And I want you to support the Fulbright program. So any form of contact from a Fulbright alumni, a friend or a friend of Fulbright to a member is a positive. Max, uh, another question, uh, this from Rob Lively. He says, our senators and representatives have multiple offices in our state. Should we yep. plan to visit multiple offices or just one for, for each representative or senator? I love this question, Rob, because uh, you're already as ambitious as you always are uh, in supporting um, uh, I think it would be sufficient, and Max can disagree with me, uh, to visit with one of these offices for, for a given senator or representative. Um, but um, uh, maybe you have a different vantage point on that, Max. Well, you know, I think that uh, I, I, I would make sure that I visited, if possible, with the member at whatever office they would be located at on that particular day. Most United States senators have a primary state office and then they'll have multiple regional offices. Most congressional members 
will have a congressional district office and in some cases multiple congressional district offices i had five i had five district offices now they were as john pointed out they were mostly there for constituent services and constituent services at a federal level were medicare social security va benefits uh, passports immigration visas you know, if, if you had a problem with the federal government, uh, I had a member there who could assist you with uh, uh, a, a, a uh, customer service type of approach. The member visits those offices, but the member doesn't spend a large amount of time there. You can schedule a visit with the member at any office, but if you can get to the member, go for the member. If the member's not available, you really want a policy analyst or a legislative director. You want someone on the policy side as opposed to on the constituent services side. Now, you may have to take a constituent services person, and that's okay, because that person wants to do policy, but sometimes has to get buried in uh, VA benefits or something like that. But they will have better opportunity to communicate to the member than uh, than you or I. Uh, so certainly, plan a primary visit with the member or the senior member's representative, the district director, the chief of staff, or the legislative director would be the, the best options. Those are the senior members of the member staff director in the case of a U.S. senator uh, or a deputy state director. Most senators are going to have a pretty hierarchical structure. So uh, in my case, my two U.S. senators both have maintained their primary offices in Atlanta. So if I want to if I want to communicate with uh, Senator Johnny Isaacson, who is a key person in foreign uh, operation, you know, I, I'll probably go to Atlanta to see Johnny because that's where Johnny's going to be. Same thing is true of David Perdue. Now they have offices all over the state, but I would probably with them in the state capital, in the state capital city, in this case, uh, Atlanta, okay? No meeting is unimportant. And no staffer is unimportant because they influence the decision-making. So um, Max, uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left and we invite any final questions, but I did want to underscore, um, just so you understand uh, the reasoning behind our ask. Uh, I, you'll now see in front of you the slide that says at the meeting part two. And um, under the ask slash message, the second point there, urge them to help restore funding at 252 million. For those of you who are really into the policy part of this, I just wanted to explain why we chose that figure. Uh, just in case you're asked, uh, you probably won't be, but there it is. Right now, the funding is at 240 million, assuming that the current, whoop, we just went to a slide, hold on, stand by. Um, uh, assuming that the, uh, the, the government does uh, come to a final agreement, we're at 240 right now. Now we looked at 2010 funding, which is the high point of funding for the Fulbright, and translated that into today's dollars. It was $253 million at that time, and now we'll be in today's dollars, that's worth about $290 million. So we said, okay, well, in a four-year period, could we restore the funding to that level? How would we do that? Well, the way you do that is a 5% increase each year for four years. Now, that's a big ask. That's, a, that's an ambitious ask. But uh, so 252 represents the first step. In other words, 5% over the current 240. Now, again, that might be for that little detail might be way too much for you, but I just wanted you to know we went through the number 252. We didn't just make it up. Right. I think the key here is to protect, preserve, and enhance or restore the Fulbright program. 
Uh, we, again, uh, emphasize the fact that we cannot uh, tolerate or accept a, a cut of any kind, and certainly not a cut of the magnitude proposed uh, by the administration. Uh, Manford, are, are you on the line? Absolutely. I'm on the line. Can you hear me? I can. Manford Phillips, this is our president. This is Full Ride Association president. I want to thank Manford for his leadership and his service. Give him a moment to talk to people who are willing to work with us, Manford. Isn't it great to have so many people who are out there saying, hey, I, I'll, I'll stand for Fulbright. You can count on me to work with members of Congress and educate them. Uh, share with us your insights, Manford. Absolutely. Well, I have, there's very little I can share that you you and John have not already said. So I really appreciate what, what you, the presentation, and I appreciate the people who are attending this meeting. The only one thing I'd like to say, other than that, is that you might want to look at who's on the appropriations committees of the House and Senate. Uh, those folks are very particularly important to us more than most. Uh, the senators come cover quite a few states and the representatives cover quite a few of the areas where people on this call are, are actually from. So when you go in to meet with them, it's always good to know what committee they're on. Uh, what, and if it's the appropriations committee, so much the better. Uh, but that thanks for attending this this webinar and uh thanks for your enthusiasm for fulbright uh, this is really we, we appreciate it I, thank you manfred and, and yeah, i, I want to piggyback on on his input uh, when you do your research on the who might uh who might be candidates to visit with pay special attention to their committees their committee assignments their party on the committee how long have they been on the committee? How long have they been in Congress? Are they a chairman or a sub chairman? Those are key and appropriation is, is the committee. We have to make sure that they understand why Fulbright has to be supported. Appropriations, foreign affairs or foreign operations, uh, foreign relations, the House, it's called foreign relations. I think the Senate is foreign affairs. They understand the international dimension, but no member, no member is unimportant. Every member is important. Some members, by virtue of their assignments, their committees, and their seniority or their, their leadership positions, can have greater influence than others, but every member needs to be educated. Uh, last, uh, I'm gonna, one, one more shout out to Bruce Fowler. Bruce, are you on the line? I don't, I can't hear Bruce. I don't know if he's on or not. I want to make sure people understand that we have a, a wonderful uh, asset in Bruce Fowler, who's going to co-chair advocacy efforts. Like I say, uh, he may be new to the Fulbright advocacy, but he's not new to advocacy. So he brings a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge and expertise and I'm grateful for his willingness to, to be a, a part of this. Uh, well, I, I, I'm very grateful for all of you who, who took the time to join us today. It's 4.03. Uh, I re sometimes our sound quality wasn't as good as we'd like. I apologize for having a, having a mix up in slide control. That's a, a time delay that I, I couldn't quite figure out there fast enough. I appreciate John's help with that. But, if we if we remember the the, the 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 really the key is the ask and the message our ask is that they not support the proposed cuts remember now these are not cuts these are proposed cuts and the white house can do whatever it chooses to the administration can do whatever it chooses to in the proposal stage ultimately congress the members of the house and the senate will determine the funding for the Fulbright program. So we have to influence members of Congress. So we want the members to not support the administrative administration's proposed cuts. And then secondly, we wanna make sure that the member understands the value of the Fulbright program, the fact that it's an investment in national security and local economic development and in international education. It's, a, it's worth that investment we're asking that the members support restoring funding to really 2010 levels. I mean, it's 2018, and by the time this will be 2019 budget, by the time if we were able to pull this off, it'll be 2020, what, two or four, three, 
more before we get back to 210 levels. So we, we have taken an enormous amount of uh, erosion in the development and support of the Fulbright program. We, we need to reverse that. We need to reverse that. Thank Max, you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all very much. Time. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.